Lord God. You know, we, we, we miss how real these stories are and really affecting real people's lives. And we're going to see that today. And we just thank you that you have affected our lives. And well, Father God, we came here today to study your holy word. We have worshipped your word. Or your, your, we have worshipped you in, in song, Lord God. Now we worship you as we study your word. Your word is holy. Your word is right. Your word is a gift to us. And Lord, we are enraged at those that want to attack your word and tear it apart and make it say things it doesn't say. Lord, by your grace, give us the, give us the grace to keep the, the word steady and smooth and right. And just as you gave it to us, it was, as it was handed down to us by your holy apostles, you being the chief cornerstone. So, Lord, we ask you, by your gracious spirit, to teach us these kingdom principles today. We receive your help. We receive your grace. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We, and obviously you see that these, it's hard to just take one story and then move on to the next story because they're always, in, in Mark's gospel, they're always attached, it seems like. They're kind of chained to each other. And we studied last week that Jesus and the, and the Twelve are on their way to Jerusalem. The road they are on is filled with Jews making pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. The closer they get, the more people join them, coming from different directions. It's a time of celebration and joy. Many in the crowd are singing psalms of ascent as they ascend upward to the holy temple, to David's royal city, to the holiest place of all, to God's throne on earth, which is what they considered the holy of holies to be. And so there was a great festival atmosphere. And some of them, like I said, were singing these psalms of ascent. I talked to you about that last week. I picked one written by David himself. It's only three verses. But it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is. You may have read this before and not realize that this was written for this mass of Jews that are on their way to go to the holy temple, to David's city, to, for this great celebration of the Passover. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to, to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edges of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. I really think sometimes that for the seven major feasts of Israel, this is what God had in mind, was that this would call the nation together, keeping them in, in, a, in a group, keep, keeping them united around something. And uh, so you have this, this fellowship as they're singing and they're uh, enjoying getting, going up to the celebration. There may have been a sense of unity in the crowds as they all head for the same celebration, but there was little unity in the disciples of Jesus. We saw last week, even knowing that their master is headed for a horrible, grisly death, James and John, along with their mother, pulled Jesus aside to ask him something. He says to them, what do you want me to do for you? That's going to be important. Remember when they came to him and mom is there? And he said, they said, oh, we want you to do something for us without telling him what it was. And he said, what is it you want me to do for you? Their answer was that in his glorious kingdom, one of them should sit in a place of honor on his right hand and one on his left. Jesus answered them saying to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And of course, once the other disciples understood what James and John had done, there wasn't much unity left. So even though all the people may be celebrating and rejoicing together in one spirit going up to Jerusalem, there isn't much unity among the disciples of Jesus because they're still infighting over who's going to have these positions of prominence. I think personally that we are going to be very surprised at who sits in the positions of honor in, in heaven. I don't think it's going to be who we think it, it is because nothing is quite as it seems. I'd like to share a story with you, a little humorous little story that I've shared probably been some time ago now. You may remember it, you may not, so indulge me that I repeat this because there's a great lesson in it. Imagine that we're all in heaven, and it is the time for the reward of the saints, 
And we're in this great big hall in heaven, so big that all the saints that ever were and was are all gathered together, even with the angels of God, in this huge auditorium. And up on the stage, there's a line of trophies, starting with small trophies, and they got bigger as they went. So finally, the last trophy is the size of a man. It's a huge trophy. And there's a pastor out in the audience who nudges the guy next to him, and he says, you see all those trophies up there? See the big one at the end? It's mine. It's mine because I started the first church of God in Samasama County, Texas. He's just beaming, you know, and Lord gets up on the stage and he's announcing these awards, giving these trophies out. And when he says a name, the angel flies and gets that person and brings them up on the stage and God personally hands them their trophy. And the pastor out in the audience is hitting the guy on the other side of me. He says, you see all them? He says, you see the big one? I mean the big one down there. He says, that's my trophy. He says, because I started the first Church of God in Samasama County, Texas. That's my big trophy. You watch. So they start working down the line and the trophies start getting a little bigger and the angels are going out and getting all the people and finally it comes down to the big trophy. And this guy, he's just ready for that angel to come and grab him. He's slicking back his hair. He's looking good. He knows that angel's coming because he started the first church of God in Samasama County, Texas. So the Lord gets up there and opens the envelope and reads the name. He says, then the winner of the big trophy is Mrs. Miller. And the angel goes out the back of the auditorium and gets his 89-year-old grandmother and brings her up on the stage. And God hands her the, the trophy, moves it over by and says, Mrs. Miller, this is your trophy. And you earned it because for 15 years you prayed on your knees that I would send a pastor to start the first church of God in Samasama County, Texas. A lot of truth in that. The other thing that I think of is I saw a film I really can't remember the origin of this film. I don't know if it was Voice for the Martyrs or just one that, that Jim Teague had showed me in the past. But I was horrified, and you'll understand why in a minute, by this film. And when I was working in India, I knew there was a great deal of oppression of the Christians that were there. It is very much a Hindu nation. And they'll tell you the caste system doesn't exist. It exists, okay? And they make those that convert to Christ take Christian names because it makes them stand out. They want them to stand out. They want to know who the Christians are so they can persecute them. And where I was staying in this mansion, was blessed to stay at, all the waiters were Christians and they had names like Christopher or, or something else. They had to take like English names or they had to take biblical names, but they could not have their long Hindu names. They weren't, they weren't known for who they were. They were known because now they were Christian and that rubbed everybody the wrong way. So being a Christian in India, you can only get menial jobs and you're supposed to use that Christian name so people will know. And anyway, on this film, it showed a septic system. And it had like a manhole cover. And this Indian gentleman removed the manhole cover, and it wasn't a storm drain, it was a cesspool drain. And it was clogged. And when he lifted that cover, you could literally see the feces floating, the, the human feces floating in this gravy of filth. And the only way to unplug that system was for them to go into that and in the darkness underneath that filth keeping their eyes closed and their nose and they're trying to keep their mouth closed and their eyes closed they had to feel their way and feel the the clogging you know what that was holding this all up from doing its thing and draining and when that because I, I first thought at first nobody's going to get in that mess I mean you, even though it was on film it was like it was so powerful you could smell it even though you weren't there and this man went head first into that. And he was under there for a minute, and he'd come up and get a grasp of air and he'd go back down. And the reason this man is working in that type of filth is because he chose Christ. He chose Christ. And this is the only job he can get. And when he came out of that, they tried to find a public shower where he can hose off or even just a hose so he doesn't have to go home to his family smelling like that. So it may well be when they said, Lord, we want to sit on your right hand, on your left hand, it could be that on the left hand will be Mrs. Miller and on the right hand will be a sewer cleaner from India. We don't know. But it makes you think. The reason I'm looking back to last week's lesson is that, as, I, as I've told you so often in Mark's narratives, 
They won from one sequence of events to the other, and yet they're related to each other. So let's begin with today's teaching. It says they came to Jericho. We're going to start right there. They came to Jericho. It was a Jericho that many of the pilgrim trails came together to go up to Jerusalem. Jericho was at the bottom of the hill that led up to the holy city. And it was known as the city of palms, like the palm tree, the city of palms. There was a number of live springs in Jericho that caused it to be a flourishing oasis in the Judean wilderness. 1,400 years ago, Joshua had conquered the city by the hand of God. You all know the story. Watch around the city, praising God. Was it seven times? But where there is water, there is life. And Jericho in Jesus' day is a thriving city, a crossroads for caravan routes. It was a 7-Eleven in the desert where people would fill their water bags and go on. And Jesus and his disciples have made their pit stop in Jericho. It says, and now as he goes out of the city, they don't stay. They just, like I said, that's just a pit stop on the way. That's what Jericho was there for. And he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd. It doesn't, Mark doesn't say just and a crowd. It's a great crowd. Because you have to understand, Jesus is not anonymous to this crowd. He wasn't anonymous to the pilgrim crowd. His reputation, it isn't like all these people are going up and they, they just saw Jesus and these disciples just fellow worshipers. They know who he is. His fame has gone all throughout Israel. People know his name. People, people are rejoicing that he's there and they're, they're following him. His reputation has gone over all Israel. Now it seems that all Israel is following him. They have heard enough of Jesus to know that something is going to happen in Jerusalem. Could he really be? You know, it's kind of like now. I think even unbelievers are beginning to feel that something's happening. Something's going to happen. Something's coming. Everything is shaking. I think even the unsaved begin to understand that. It was that same way. If you read the non-biblical things that were written back in those days, all over the world uh, that they've got in history books and stuff, that uh, there was a feeling of change, of something was going to happen, something stupendous, but nobody could put their, their finger on it. But uh, all of them are following him at Jericho, and they all know enough of him that something, thinking that something is going to happen in Jerusalem. Could he really be the Messiah? His name with the title Messiah has been kicked around now for over three years. Being that Jericho is what Jericho is, the city of palms, this place of fresh water. All these people going through, traveling through, hearing Jesus' name, hearing him associated with the question of could he be the Messiah. There was a giddy sense of expectation in the crowd. They suspected that this Passover would be different from any that they had ever known. You gotta understand, Palm Sunday wasn't a program thing. Palm Sunday only happened because Jesus is in Jerusalem and they know who he is now and they're gathered around and what we're gonna read that happens today just adds to this. So don't think that, you know, I mean, that is not what the Sunday of, of what we call Palm Sunday, it was just another day. It was, it, it was a, you know what really happened on Palm Sunday? That was the day that they brought the sacrificial lamb into the house. Some of us forget that's part of, this, of the Sabbath, Sabbath ritual, that you had to become, actually you were supposed to fall in love with the lamb. And you brought that lamb in the house and be, because it, it would mean more. It wasn't just some autonomous lamb. This was the lamb that you brought into your house as baby lamb and you got to know it. And it is the one that you would later sacrifice. But Jesus turns out all on its head. I shouldn't say Jesus really as much as the people because they are so sold out that this is the Messiah that when he finally goes up the 250 mile or 25 miles, whatever it is, to get up to Jerusalem, to David's royal city, the crowds are just there waiting on him. And you know the story. He gets on the donkey, the shouting, the praising, the laying down of the palm leaves. All this is going on. And this is the crowd. It's the same crowd that you're going to see on Palm Sunday. They're just at the bottom of the hill. But this same rejoicing and all this is going on is happening already. In a, in a sense, Palm Sunday is already happening. His name was on the lips of the crowd. 
and it was heard by one man sitting on the roadside. Then they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples in that great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Blind Bartimaeus, sitting by the road begging. It was a good place for a beggar to be, especially at this time with the multitude of pilgrims going up to the Passover, passing right by him. But understand something. Bartimaeus would not normally have received much mercy from the people that would walk by him. He would probably ask for alms, ask for an, uh, a blessing for people to, to bless him if they would, to, to bless a blind man. But he wouldn't have had much favor. Very few people would have donated to him, if you will. Very few people would have given him alms, because you have to remember, this man is blind. And now in the traditions of Judaism of this day, because he is blind, he is cursed of God. Remember that any disease or disability was God's punishment. You might remember when Jesus and his disciples had come to the temple previously and they saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples reflected the theology of their day by asking him, remember, who sinned, Lord, him or his parents? But somebody had to have sinned for this to happen because this is a curse of God. This attitude had been directed towards this man for so long that he had totally lost his identity. It's amazing how many, I watched a number of different teachings on this, I looked at some commentaries. It is amazing how nobody touches on this. This man has no name. He has just become the blind man. He's just become this man cursed of God. The one you don't pay any attention to. Oh, you might feel sorry that he was cursed from God, but he must have done something. He must have sinned. He deserves what he got. But everybody says, well, he had a son. We know his name. His name is Bartimaeus. No, it's not. Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus. The only thing they called him was blind. His, his name is forgotten. We will not even learn his name in this teaching. We don't know his name. He was just blind son of Timaeus. If you called him at all, it would be, blind man! Hey, blind man! Nobody knows his name. He, he's not even identified as a human being. He's a cursed man, of God, man cursed by God that he must have done something wrong to have this blindness. This beggar, this blind man. I mean, I mean you think about it. Jesus was Yahshua bar Yosef, Jesus, son of Joseph. Simon was Simon bar Jonah. Simon, son of Jonah, but there is no name for far this son of Timaeus except that he's a blind man. But this is a good day for Bartimaeus to be begging on the roadside. Most who are passing by are pilgrims on their way to the Passover. And one of the requirements of the Passover that had been handed down by tradition was that you must go out at the, during the time of the Passover, during this week of the Passover, you must go out and find someone poorer than yourself and bless them. And it may be that that might have started with him. Maybe this was a time to receive more offerings than he normally, more alms than he normally would have. We go on. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So when he heard it was Jesus, he was blind, but he wasn't deaf. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Nazarene. He's heard the name over and over again by the pilgrims going by. And over the last seven years, why it was just 20 miles up the road, hadn't he raised a man from the dead named Lazarus? He had heard from the passerbys of his miracles and his healings. And here he was passing by him. And this may be his one and only chance. And so he begins to cry out. And again, test time. Why do we like that the New, or the New Testament is in Greek? Because it is precise. Never lose track of that. I mean, God raised up kingdoms. God raised up, um, I'm falling a blank. So Philip of Macedon and his son. I hate that. I 
thank you. Well, I said, Alexander the Great raised him up, spread him out all over. There, there's there's, there's two, two reasons that the empires are in history that you may not be aware of. The Greek empire was blessed to go as, as what was it? Alexander. As Alexander went throughout all the known world because he Hellenized the culture and he gave them a common language. And it just so happens that Greek is very precise. Just for the word love, there's five different words. Is it eros? Is it... Uh, Storge, is it agape, is it eros, is it any of these things, and it can identify that, and we lose that in our translations. But two things in history was that the civilization would be Hellenized so that there would be a precise language to write the New Testament in, and also the Roman uh, success, the success that Rome had, was done so that there would be what they called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, so that the gospel could go freely without borders all around the known world. So those two evidences of history that happened for that. Now, the reason I go back to this preciseness of the Greek language is because when we just write, he cried out, it's not precise enough. In the Greek, it is the word kradzo, and it means a scream of ungovernable emotion or passion. It is an animal cry. This isn't some guy just yelling out, oh, Jesus, son of David. This is an animal cry. This is, this is a heart-wrenching cry. This is a cry that cannot be contained by passion. Jesus, thou son of David, this man who has no name, who has begged for probably most of his life, who people have ignored and just felt him cursed of God, and they treated him like a leper. And now Jesus is coming by and he's heard. And where does faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the Word of God. He's heard about Jesus. He's heard the testimonies. He's, he's heard them as they walk by. In his darkness, he's heard this. But he is not deaf. He is blind. And he has heard. And faith comes by hearing. And he cries out. And you have to know this is faith because Jesus tells him later on, he says, after he heals, he says, your faith has made you whole. Where did he get this faith? By hearing, by hearing, by hearing, and by hearing. So he's got some idea. And as somebody said, he saw Jesus with his heart before he saw him with his eyes. And he screams and he yells out. He knows that this is possible because of who this man is. People may not know his first name, but he knows the name of Jesus. And at that name, faith was ignited, faith that comes by what he heard. And he screams, Jesus, son of David, that is the messianic title that he knew full well. In fact, it's funny, he has no name, but when he called out Jesus, son of David, he would have said, Yahshua bar David. He knew Jesus had a name even though he didn't. Have mercy on me. We go on. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Another bad translation to the Greek because we can't we don't have those words the, to, to bring it to today's understanding then many warned him to be quiet in the Greek they literally told him to shut up it's nothing nice I can't clean it up I can't make it nice I can't make it polite it wasn't it was will you you cursed thing of God shut up this is the Messiah come on you're spoiling the joy he's here we're going to go with him. We're all headed up to Jerusalem. Too bad you can't go, you cursed of God. So will you shut up? You're disturbing the master. But his cries, we read, just got louder. Then we read this remarkable sentence. So Jesus stood still. That is one of the most beautiful lines in Scripture. It is a great word of love. Jesus stood still. Some translations say Jesus stopped. Jesus stood still. Why is it beautiful? Do you remember what we studied last week? Do you remember why the disciples were amazed at Jesus? They know, and he knows, that he's headed for this grisly death. And remember it says, and as they, as they walked, Jesus was in front of them. 
Jesus was taking the lead. Jesus was on the march. Jesus going forward as the bond slave of God, knowing he was headed to a hideous death. He was anxious to get Jerusalem. Remember how we talked about that? He was anxious to get to Jerusalem so he could accomplish the Father's will. He wasn't in a hurry to die, but he, 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 gee, we don't think like Jesus. We, we think about his crucifixion, and yes, that's part of it, but Jesus looked at the bigger picture. He was doing the will of God. The cross just fell into that will of God. If God had told him to go to the moon and back, he would have done that, but God laid the cross in front of him, and in his love for the Father and his desire to be God's bond slave, he says, I will do whatever you do. What do you want me to do? Remember we looked in Hebrews. He says, a, a body you have fashioned for me that I may do your will, O God. So Jesus, knowing that he's headed for the cross, knows he's headed there to fulfill God's will, and he is consumed by that. This is the bond slave on the march, focused on one purpose, his face set like flint, consumed with his objective. But then he hears a voice thinking the cross, thinking the will of God, knowing he's there. He's leading the disciples. He's leading the charge. He's on his way to fulfill his Father's will. He's going on to do the thing that would make him the happiest of all, to please his Father. And in the midst of that march, he hears a voice cry out, Son of David, have mercy. Bam! Jesus stands still. That march to Jerusalem has stopped. We read on. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. I made a statement here, and my wife thought it might be objected to, but you're all adults in this room. Have you ever seen a bigger bunch of brown nosers in your life? I haven't seen this many brown nosers since Santa's reindeer. You all know the story. Let me find my note. I don't want to get it wrong. All the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names. But then one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? Then how the reindeer loved him. Corporate America. Isn't it? I mean, did you ever realize that song, how dumb it is? They hated him because of his nose. They wouldn't play with him. They tormented him. But the moment that Santa could use him, that's my boy. Look what's happening here. Shut up! Shut up! You're bothering the Messiah. Bring him to me. Oh, okay. Get up. Get up. The Master wants you. Surprise, Jesus. <laughs> Didn't bring down lightning bolts sometimes. Look at the change in the people. From shut up to, oh, you're so lucky. The Master is calling you. They tell him to cheer up and go see Jesus. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. I had some trouble with this. Because I, as I always tell you, the Holy Spirit never wastes words. And I can't quite figure this out. Why does that really affect the story? And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. He could have just said he rose and came to Jesus. Why are we told he threw aside his garment? I believe personally that the garment he had on was kind of like a begging garment. I believe it was just something that he sat there in and everybody was used to seeing him and it was in this thing that he begged for help. But I think this was a sign of faith. I think he knew so full well that Jesus was going to heal him because remember he says it by your faith that you were healed. That I think this was a sign of faith. He threw those garments off knowing he would never need them again. The man with no name could see things better than all the people who were cited at that time. We go on. And Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? If you remember, that is the exact... I mean, this is no act. He is still teaching his disciples. He's still got to be irked 
that James and John had, had asked him that question, you know, that we want you to do something for us. Uh, he's got to be irked that, you know, they, they've argued about this before. Remember, there was another point where the disciples this time were, were leading away from Jesus so they could argue amongst themselves who was going to be the greatest. And he comes up to them and says, what were you talking about on the road? And they said, oh, well, you know, we were just uh, having a conversation because they were embarrassed that they were doing it. So Jesus is teaching them, and he uses the exact words that he used when James when Peter and, or James and John and their mother asked him to do something for them. He said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Ask the same exact question. This encounter is not just for the blind man's benefit. It was also for, as an example of the disciples. It's not by accident that Jesus asked the exact same question he asked of James and John. Jesus asked the blind man this question, and his answer is simple. The blind man, man sorry, excuse me, the blind man said to him, Rabboni, great master, that I might receive my sight. Lord, I don't need honor. Lord, I don't seek power. I don't seek influence. I don't seek wealth. I just want to see. Jesus' response, and Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Luke adds in his rendition of this that he didn't just follow Jesus, he followed Jesus glorifying God. And there is nothing more than Jesus would have wanted than for somebody he helped to give God the glory because he's the bond slave of God. Remember we, we talked in John where he said, he cried out, if you're not really believing in me, you're believing in the one who sent me. It's not me who does this. It is, it's not my words, it's God's word. He wants God to get all the credit, all the glory. And now this blind man is following him, giving God glory, and had to put a big smile on Jesus' face because this is exactly what he wanted. When Jesus' disciples asked him about their positions of prominence in the kingdom, Jesus said this to them. Let's go back in time a minute. He said this, remember, whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. Notes that if I was you, I'd put in my Bible, again because of the translation, the word servant is the word waiter, is the word waiter. You know what a waiter is. A waiter stands off to the side and watches and wonders and asks occasionally, is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can get for you? And if that person needs anything, the waiter goes and gets it and, and, and kind of spoils him and waits on him. And he says, and whichever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. The word slave there is the word bond slave. So Jesus is saying, that if you want to be a success in his kingdom, that you're going to have to be a waiter and you're going to have to be a bond slave. And in these few moments with Bartimaeus, Jesus demonstrates this truth. He heard his cry and he stops and he waits on him. What can I do for you? That's the, that's the voice of a waiter. What can I do for you? When he wants to be healed, Jesus becomes the bond slave. He becomes a bond slave to Bartimaeus. Because he says here, you've got to be a bond slave of all. Now, you see, there's something going on here. It's hard for me to end this teaching. Because I know how it applies to me, but I might not know how it applies to you. So this is one of the things where you've got to make it personal to you. What you see going on here is simply this. Jesus has an overall commitment to be the bond slave to the Father. We know he's consumed by it. He cries for people to understand that it's not him doing the work. It is the Father. Oh, Philip, what do you mean? Show me the Father. Have, have I been with you so long and you still don't understand that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, you see the frustration in this? You see him leading the charge to Jerusalem because it's the will of the Father. This is what he lives for? It's been that way since his birth. Remember, 12 years old in the temple. Don't you know I should be about my father's business? He is committed to be the bond slave of the Lord. 
But yet, Jesus stops, waits on a man, becomes a bond slave to Bartimaeus. And I think the thing that comes out of this, just read it as I wrote it here. We may be a bond slave committed to one master, but we are a waiter and a bond slave to all. I wrote it out this way. We never want to be so focused on our purpose that we miss opportunities to bless both God and men. So I can get wrapped up and say, well, you know, my thing, my commitment to the Lord is to teach His Word, to teach it as well as I can, explain it as simply as I can, make people understand the Word of God, see these kingdom principles, see how the Bible relates. If you ask me what my desire for you is, I want you to be the best Bible scholars in the world. Why? So you can be the best witnesses in the world. You're not going to be like the world when they ask the hard questions and they go, oh, well, um, I, I don't know. You know what the Word of God says. You know the science of salvation. We studied it together. But if that consumes me, and it does, it consumes me every week. I do four teachings a week now. And I love it. I get tired, but I love it. But if somebody asks me for help in the meantime, I can't say I don't have time because I've got to do this, because I've got this, this main call. Are you understanding this? Whatever your call is in your life, whatever duty you feel to God, be consumed by it. Do it all. Do it well. And only you can answer what that is. But be ready to stop. Be ready to stand still. And be ready to be somebody's waiter and to be somebody's bond slave. Because he said it has to be for all. And you've got to, and Jesus said, let this mind that's in him be in you and be in me. The more I study this, beloved, this isn't elective 101. This isn't an option that you can vie for. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to pick up your cross, your will of God, and follow me. Be consumed by it. Do it with all your heart and mind. I mean, don't we notice that everything with God is always to the max? We're not supposed to just love Him. We're supposed to love Him with our heart, mind, soul, strength, every bit of everything we've got we're supposed to love Him. I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Be hot. Be something. You know, get on with the living or get on with the dying. It's our Lord. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and uh, suffers, allows violence, and the violent take it by force. There's no mamby pamby Christianity with God. It's all or nothing. You sell every jewel that you have because you found the pearl of great price. And it means more to you than anything. Each of us has a calling. Each of us has a gifting. Each of you has something that God wants you to accomplish in your life for all of us. But we can't be so consumed by that that we don't hear the cries of somebody that says, Thou Son of David, have mercy on me. Making sense? I don't, I don't know how to end this for you. Only you can answer just like only I can answer for me. What I'm supposed to do and yet still be somebody's waiter to be somebody's... I mean. Jesus could have easily heard the cry and said, but I've got to get to Jerusalem. But I've got to finish the will of my Father. I don't have time to see this man. But he's true. He's giving the example of what... He just told them, you have to be a waiter and you have to be a bond slave. Bartimaeus wasn't there by accident. This was all laid out in the plan of God because in Bartimaeus he showed, you can stop. Stop your charge to Jerusalem. Stop your heading towards the fullness of the will of God because you're also doing the will of... I mean, he wasn't out of the will of God to stop. He was in the will of God to stop and wait and be a bond slave to Bartimaeus, to this man who has no name. The man whom everyone ignored and Jesus wasn't going to ignore him. And what's the result? That man followed Jesus, glorifying God, and Jesus is so happy because God, his Father, is getting the glory. Say it again. We never want to be so focused on our purpose that we miss opportunities to bless both God and man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together today. Lord, show us the fulfillment of this.
We want to be good disciples. We want to follow you. We're not asking for an easy path. We're not asking to cut corners. We ask that you use us as you see fit for the furtherance of your kingdom, the increase of your family, whatever you would have us to do. Lord, don't let us miss those Bartimaeus times, the time when somebody who's off to the side of the road that pulls us away from our purpose, and yet it's still our purpose to love them, to bless them, and to be good to them. And in so doing, Father, you get the glory. Your, your word tells us that we should do the good works that were preordained for us before the foundation of the world that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Father, help us to complete our destinies. Everyone in this room has a destiny, has a, has a plan, has a gift, has a purpose in your kingdom. We may not fully understand that. What we do understand is every day we should give ourselves to you and say, here we are, Father, holy priesthood, offering you a holy sacrifice. Use us as you see fit. That's all we need to know and that's all we need to do and let God arrange the rest because the rest of it's out of our out of our power. It's above our paycheck. But we are here, Father. Every single day that we draw breath, we are here to serve you. Let us not be so consumed in one thing that we cannot hear the cries for mercy that might be very close to us. Use us and show us. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. Make us faithful waiters and faithful bond slaves, not only to our Lord Jesus, but to all. Only you can do that, Lord. Make us broken people that we are. Make us perfect in your sight. Make us perfect in fulfilling your will. And we love you for it. To you be all the glory, Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Have a great week, beloved. And if I don't see you next week, have a great Father's Day. Please remember to take some of the prayer requests for the prison. And like I said, if you want to be held up in prayer or, or somebody, just uh, give us a first name, fill out the request, and we'll make sure it goes to them.